Hi, everyone, and welcome to Heal Endometriosis Naturally with Wendy K. Laidlaw. Wendy has spent the last two years helping women with various stages of endometriosis to heal naturally after putting her condition into remission. After her own healing success from stage four endometriosis and adenomyosis, she's inspired to heal others, and her goal is to help some of the 175 million women know that there is another way other than painkillers, drugs, or surgery. This is the place to be for real talk with real people for real results so you can learn how to heal your endometriosis naturally. Please note that the opinions expressed in this program may represent options but are not a substitute for proper medical care. Before starting any new healthcare program, we recommend you consult with a health professional. Hey everyone, it's Wendy Kiladlo here. I hope as always that this finds you well. Um, today I'm going to be talking about hearts, hurts and hugs. Um, I think a really um, underestimated part of this journey is how um, when, we, when we start to, to make all these uh, sort of physical changes and adaptations from the produce to the products to the environment, the Wi-Fi, all these different things, we, we obviously underestimate the impact of what's going on inside, deep side, deep down in our, in our brain and in our hearts and in our soul and how we've been affected over the course of, of, the, of our lifetime, which brings us back to kind of when we're talking about the five P's, the produce, products, property, past and people. It's amazing how um, even what past elements might still be living um, within us that may have been transferred down through generations through through our mother or our, our grandmother or a great grandmother or indeed even the male side of the, the lineage of the family as well. So when we start on this journey, we start to kind of uh, increase our awareness by writing things down, just noticing what is happening and how we're feeling to certain things. Um, we start to become aware that there's almost this thaw that goes on within our, our heart, if you like, because when you've had uh, years if not decades, and in many cases with women with endometriosis, all having your hopes raised and dashed, it gets to the point where you start not wanting to have any hope for healing. You end up start, starting to think that endometriosis is actually a life sentence and that you are stuck in this way of thinking for, uh, or way of being um, endlessly. Um, I was asked recently to, to write an article for this, this new website. And whilst I am um, answered some questions that they had, they completely turned everything around right at the very end and basically helped women have no hope by the very end of the article because it's so mainstream that um, people are conditioned to believe that this is a uh, lifelong condition. Uh, why would people, um, why would women want to even have hope? I know I had almost given up complete hope before I came on this journey. And this is why I still do what I do to this day. And I will to the day I die is share this message of hope and healing. And so when we're thinking about hope and healing, then we come back, as I say, if you've had that continual being let down, disappointed, uh, chastised, criticised, um, even bullied and mistreated in certain cases, which happens to a lot of women with endometriosis, then they, they, you start to shut down your heart. You literally, you start to put um, metal bars across it. You start to kind of, um, to protect yourself from all those uh, dashed hopes and hurts that have been, been round about you. And that can feel, the, the amount of energy that that takes to protect yourself alone is exhausting. And that's why I think a lot of people, a lot of women, you know, really, um, they, they have that burning ember in them, in them to, to kind of keep figuring out like what's going wrong, but yet also get, get completely overwhelmed by the condition when they think that actually I'm stuck with this condition forever, because it's like, where do you start? And I know I, I put all my energy into one particular pathway, which was a medical pathway, like everybody else does, because that's what we are conditioned to do. We don't know any different, which is fine, which is great. And, and you know, uh, there are some, as, as I've said many of the time, there are many advancements, which are inc incredibly impressive. But when it comes to the gynecological realm, it's a very well-worn pathway and needs to be modernized and needs to be reinvented how the, the training is done. It's very uh, old fashioned training, old fashioned, uh, you know, they have not advanced the approaches. There might be more robotic uh, surgeries that can be done now, which just freaks me out the prospect of, of um, 
anything going in in your ab abdominal area that can cause all these different types of side effects that, that and many women I know in my case were not warned of. So then you get to the point of uh, seeking uh, down a pathway uh, of which they're, they're, it's, it's merely symptom suppression rather than looking for the root cause. So this article, um, I'm actually going to be asking for my name to be removed from because it is not what I stand for. What I stand for is to sh give women uh, increase their awareness, their information, uh, and of course, educate them and keep them inspired because of course, putting any condition into remission, it isn't an overnight thing. It takes time. I mean, I talk anywhere between six to 12 months. In some cases, depending on previous history, it may take longer. But what we do know from a physiological and biological perspective is the cell regeneration and the cell repair that happens from a, a molecular level. And it does so every single day if we support the immune system to do what it wants to do, which of course is to remove any pathogens or any viruses or bacteria that are, um, are, are, are negatively affected the body. And if you look at endometriosis from, from what it is, it's an inflammatory condition. It is, it, it is it's almost like fire going on inside in, in the belly. So then we have to look, well, what is causing that fire? Why has fire shown up in my abdomen? You know, with other people, it might be in their heart, it might be in their back, it might be in their head, it might be with another disease. But with endometriosis, we're saying, what has caused the fiery flame in my abdomen? What has caused the displacement of endometrial tissue, which isn't like another, another question. There's lots of sort of theories about that, whether it's genetic or anything else. It doesn't kind of even really matter. What matters is, is why is the immune system, the body's own regulatory system, not able to, um, to mop up and eradicate what, what is actually in there by itself. And then you've got to say, well, what is stopping that natural healing process? So this is very much so by the time you reach a point where you've, uh, I heard of a lady who'd had 26 surgeries for this condition the other day. And, and, and it really kind of uh, feels quite shocking to me that, uh, you know, there's no other industry in the world that you would have repeated failures over and keep going back to get yet another uh, uh, disappointment. So is it any wonder that people are so um, down and, and feel lost of hope? Women that, that think, what is the point? That is one of the number one things that a lot of women uh, will say to me is they, they're scared to have hope now. And I think that is so, so sad. We've seen so many things happen over the past, you know, six months in various parts of the world where, you know, people were, their hope was restored and, and hope is really important for the healing process because it allows us to connect to our heart. It allows us to kind of really listen to our heart to help heal the hurts of the heart. And then ultimately learning how to develop self-compassion, which is obviously giving, our, giving ourselves our own hugs. In certain parts um, of um, war-torn countries, there has been people gone out and, and obviously helped the children or the, the, the adults deal with the trauma of what they've seen in their war-torn -tor countries. And one of the, um, a, a really lovely technique that is used and taught is what they call the butterfly hug. It's when you cross your arms uh, over your, your chest, you put your, your right hand on your left shoulder and your left hand on your right shoulder and you gently tap from left to right to left to right with, with a gentle rocking motion. And the idea of that butterfly hug is it's to stimulate the left and the right brain as well. It's called bilateral stimulation because again, the marvelous, the marvel that is the brain and the body, they're always trying to re-regulate and rebalance themselves. And if that doesn't happen, then you have to keep saying, well, what, what is preventing that natural process? But if you can stick with the, the body's always wanting to get back to that equilibrium and that balance, uh, that is what is the exciting element for me. So even when there's been trauma, even when there has been an event or a situation, how come some people can just walk away from that unscathed and, and unaffected? And others, they could be paralyzed um, or have crippling disease for the rest of their life. So this is what has sort of driven me to kind of understand, try to get under the hood of the car, if you like, trying to get un into the, the inner workings of the whys. Why is our brain holding on to something that we can't let go of? And why is our body unable to, uh, you know, be strong enough or um, 
effective enough to remove whatever it is the disease how come some people can get over and some others can't so this is where uh, developing self-compassion firstly to to meet yourself where you're at is very very important and and i and i talk about this in my second edition um, of my book, which is due for release on March the 12th uh, on Amazon. And for that one day, you will get it at 50% off because I really want, you know, to get this renewed or revised and updated information into your hands. But what I talk about is the importance of paying attention. Most of us are so busy that, you know, we, 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 uh, we're, we're just surviving. And what we're looking to do, especially as a woman with endometriosis, is to, to learn how to pay attention in a very positive and effective way that's going to nurture you to come back to what is your heart thinking and feeling? Are you just, have you just put so many metal barriers up and protective mechanisms that you're just uh, detached from, you know, what, what is it, the idea of even having something that, that gives you passion just makes you feel kind of like, wh why would I even think about having hope and passion and joy and, and, and travel and all these different things when my body's constantly letting me down? So in my new book, I, I, my updated and revised book, again, I come back to, you know, the, the wh why, why, do, why does it work for some and not for others? And this is where we're, if we can learn to understand that we have these different psychological parts within us that, uh, and what I mean by that is if you imagine like a, a cast of characters on a uh, on a stage, we have all these different parts of us that that, that respond and, and uh, react and show up in different different situations with different people. You can be different with your mother and father than you'll be with your friends. And and, and the same kind of goes for, um, as I say, the, these parts, I, I use the analogy, imagine that we are the driver of our bus. We are the driver with our hands around the steering wheel and behind us in the seats are all these different ages and stages and parts of you that have, you know, had their different needs and their different wants. Now, at various stages of growing up, we'd have various stages of understanding of our world, our environment, our body, our feelings, our emotions. And if we didn't have what we needed growing up, then we learned to compensate and adapt. So we'd have done that through getting super busy all the time or being a shopaholic or maybe drinking lots of alcohol or doing something to try and dull and numb the pain. So when we're talking about coming back to your heart, it really is a very important element. This is not sort of weird, wacky or woo-woo stuff here. It's a genuine, almost placing your hand on your heart, feeling your heart and thinking, what is my heart's desire? Not as, as a, an external material thing or an external person, what is your heart's desire for yourself? Because if you are relating to this, then you know that you have the possibilities. You know that from, a, and this is again, where my book, um, I go into a lot more details with lots of uh, bibliographies and even with testimonials now from doctors validating the science behind how possible it is to, to learn what is causing uh, inflammation, hormonal imbalance and uh, affecting and impairing your immune system because if you can figure out the why as in what is preventing it that's why I talk about the five p's then you can do something about it and and it's marvelous it's such a, a marvelous thing to to hear from <clears throat> the women that have been uh, have improved their lives and their bodies uh, just from my book let alone the women that have gone through my programs and totally transformed their life so when it comes to hearts hurts and hugs the the, the essence of the journey is self-compassion, increased awareness, really learning to understand, to, to I keep asking the why, keep questioning what you're being told and check back into your own instincts to, to validate uh, internally if that feels right, really to slow things down. I think there's a lot of pressure. I've heard, I've heard of women who have had a uh, been on a wait list for it to speak to a doctor. They saw them that day and they were pressurized to have surgery the next day. Whatever has happened for you, again, if that's happened to you, and I know there's lots of women who have had tremendous, awful, 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 tremendous pressure put upon them for, for various procedures and various things that they felt scared that they would be rejected and abandoned by the very people that were supposed to support them, that they ended, ended up going ahead with certain things that they didn't want to do, then naturally you're going to hold hurts in your heart. Naturally you're going to feel... Um, uh, upset, angry, bitter, even rageful. And I think what I want to encourage you to do is to, to, to journal, to put onto paper, you know, what your feeling states are so that you can reconnect back to yourself. It, it won't happen overnight, 
but even the very act of placing your hand on your heart, putting your right hand on your heart and then putting your left hand over your right and feeling the warmth of that allows you to really almost feel the hurt. And then if you can feel the hurt or the mistreatment uh, and the injustice of what's happened to you in your body, and you can then keep that, what might be a blockage in that area, moving through, through the act of writing, you literally can write your way back to health. And what I mean by health is emotional health and physical health and mental health and spiritual health, because uh, all too often our, our, the medical field split us off into different categories that you go and see someone for, for a, a psychiatrist and then you go and see someone for, for your intestinal tract or you go and see someone for, for gynecology. You're, you are one whole body, whole person. And, and, and if you can understand that um, what it is is a communication problem, i.e. you've been unable to hear for whatever reason, you didn't get what you needed growing up, you weren't able to hear and tune in to your body and into your brain, into your feelings, into your emotions, because it was too scary and too fearful, then you can really start to develop compassion, self-compassion, really tone down or tune out the, um, or not even tune out, but tune down, I should say, the internal critic that might be there in, in, in your head. Now, my view of the internal critic, uh, again, it's one of many parts that would be within our, within our uh, psyche. Um, my view of the inner critic is it's been trying to keep you safe. There's a lot of new age psychology out there that says death to the critic and you should um, swear at it and get rid of it and all that kind of stuff. That critic has kept you safe up until this point. It has probably over chastised you, which is why I normally suggest to, to my clients to re we really, really just, again, increase the awareness of the words that we're using. Are the words that we're using for ourselves helpful or hurtful? If they're not helpful, then, you know, and they're hurtful, then we need to kind of a, increase the awareness and ask if that is true. Is that hurtful phrase that you say to yourself or you say to other people about yourself, is that, uh, is that helpful? If it's not helpful and, and how does it make you feel in your body, if it makes you feel yuck in your body, then consider swapping it out with another word or maybe toning it down or maybe just ideally even stop saying that and saying something, shifting it in 180 degree. Because what I've learned about the women with endometriosis is they are incredibly highly intuitive and sensitive people. And I really, if you're listening to this and you relate to that, I so really want to encourage you um, to embrace it. Please don't like shove it away because that's what we do is we put barriers up. We uh, we chain around our, chain around our heart to protect ourselves because it's we've been so wounded and and, and let down by people and situations and things that we end up sort of thinking, you know, I, you don't know if you can deal with this. You can deal with this if you can learn self-compassion and you can learn to, to embrace who you are at your core. If you can learn to, to see the hurts for what they are, which is mistreatment, and you can learn to slowly um, can reconnect through all the protection that you've done over the years, because you've had to do that, to really then come back what I say to, to the hugs, uh, hugging yourself, um, gently rocking yourself, what I call parenting yourself. You know, you, you may have to seek imaginary parents to really fulfill and validate a, a scene in your head that is a safe one and that works for you so that you get the, the nurturance that you need. But what you're really looking to do is to connect to yourself in, in a new way that is empowering and comforting and, and soothing so that you can uh, allow the, the the nice hormones to come in through your body. So the dopamine, the oxytocin, serotonin, all these types of, of elements that are, are uh, evident and, and you can tap into quite easily because they themselves can actually help in, in the healing process. The problem is, is, is a lot of us aren't aware of um, that we have this healer within ourselves. We, we, we look externally for that healing, whether it's emotional, psychological, spiritual, and, and of course, physical. And, um, and again, what, one of my main things that I talk about is we have, as a species, have been around for millions of years, and the medical field itself has only been around for 100. And whilst there's been some incredible feats when it comes to gynecology and, in, and, and deep emotional trauma, um, the systems need to be modernized. They need to be up, upgraded and updated 
to, to really um, meet the advancement of the science that is now out there. You know, there is science out there right now that can validate that nanoparticles can speak to each other from other parts of the world. Before that was just seen as kind of wacky and weird. Now there's proof of that. Again, with the brain, the neuroplasticity aspect of the brain, i.e. we can reconnect, we can rewire our brain from trauma, but we can't do any of those things until we can develop compassion, until we can really um, allow ourselves that uh, connection to, to the more vulnerable parts of ourselves that, um, that we probably ran away from most of our life because we didn't know how to connect to them. It wasn't safe to be around, um, it wasn't safe to be around uh, ourselves in that capacity or to lower our guard. So therefore we end up you know, uh, shielding our heart because our heart feels uh, so bruised and wounded. And, um, and I remember doing uh, the, this process with, with a counselor once and she asked me to, to, to visualize my heart, uh, come back, you know, just to close my eyes and visualize my heart. And I remember uh, tears coming down my, my cheeks. I just, I, I had such resistance to even visualizing that. And of course, um, you know, visualizing is one thing and imagining is another, but imagining that my heart was kind of, I was, and what came up for me was this very battered, bruised, scarred and almost shriveled heart that had, that was there. And it saddened me so much because I'd always wanted to, um, at that time, it saddened me so much because I'd, I'd, I'd had such love and passion and desire to, to help other people. But what I'd realized is in the process of putting myself continually out there in that capacity for others and not doing it in the same way for myself, I'd had all these uh, hurts in my heart, basically. And I didn't know how to hug myself. I didn't know how to, um, to, to comfort myself or have compassion for myself, quite the opposite. All I knew was that I needed protecting, that I needed, I was constantly on guard. I couldn't trust anyone and um, no one was safe and, and my body was a mess and my brain was a mess and my emotions were a mess and everything. So you can see how just learning to pay attention to your heart, just one small thing, as I say, just putting your hand over your heart, right, putting your left over right hand. And even just doing that before you go to sleep at night can have a, a very, it's so subtle. I think, I think, I think a lot of us are guilty of, of we look for big, massive, gigantic statements and quick fixes. This journey is not only about connection to yourself, but is about recognizing the power of just the small. It's the old little by little, little becomes a lot. With the very act of the hand on the heart is self-compassion in itself. And now when I see my heart, when I do my imaginations or visualization, my heart is full now. My heart is regenerated. My heart is big. My heart is, is pink and red and, and fluffy compared to the, the shriveled, battered heart that was there before behind metal bars. So as I say, as part of this journey and tapping into that, that, that innate healer that, that's in you, whether it be in, in your brain and in your body, the brain and the body are instinctively connected. If the body is not healing, it's because um, at the, uh, uh, deep in the brain, there is trauma that has been unrealized. And the only way to, there are the fantastic uh, tools out there now and, and therapies, and that's where I do believe that, that the uh, psychological realm has, has uh, progressed in some ways, there's some deep brain reprocessing, DBR, uh, which again is, is a wonderful way for you to, um, to really connect to the body. This, that, that was an area that I struggled with was how, how do I connect to my body without sort of you know, overwhelming myself and, and deep brain reprocessing in, in, in its, uh, uh, to sum up very, very briefly is again, using your imagination. It's very challenging for a lot of women with endometriosis to use their imagination because their imagination has been invariably uh, about catastrophizing and the negativity and the mistreatment and the abuse of what has happened to a woman. So again, coming back to the, the hurts and, and the hopes being, dis, uh, hopes being dashed and disappointed, um, this is something I've had to work very hard on, very challenging on, um, to imagine good things, to imagine, you know, um, the, the, the body in, in, in a big way. But this is where deep brain reprocessing is wonderful because what it does is it allows you to, to gently come back into your body, which again, when you're a woman with endometriosis and 
your body's screaming at you and giving you lots of different pain and signs and symptoms, that can be a challenge, but it can be done with the right person. You know, so uh, deep brain reprocessing is about focusing on one area. So for example, for me, I was directed to come back to my heart and I could just feel the tears coming down my cheek because I had so put this behind barriers and behind bars and I didn't want anything or anyone to get in there. I'd, I'd been so let down, so disappointed. But I knew as part of my healing journey, I had to kind of, you know, re for me to reconnect because not only had I switched off from other people, which was, I think, appropriate given how they had been, but I'd also switched to off from myself. So this is where the hearts and the hurts and the hugs, you know, it's we're, if we can reconnect to our heart, uh, understanding that that we have uh, for, for very good reason protected our heart for very good reason there's there's things showing up in our body or things showing up in our emotions and our feelings um as i say the advancement in the psychological realm has been fantastic with emdr eye movement reprocessing and and um desensitization is fantastic by francine shapiro and she uh, was able to put her own cancer condition into remission um, by using that that process um, again, you've got uh, brain spotting, which is a kind of an advancement of EMDR. Again, I, I didn't find that particularly work for me and it was, it was very reactionary for me, but I know that people have, have had, again, have seen great benefits from trauma. And you know when you're suffering from trauma, when you have a reaction to something and as a part of you that goes, this is disproportionate to this current situation. Like you might be justified to have a certain feeling, but the intensity is like off the scale. That's when you know there's some past playing out in the present. So this is where these uh, fabulous advancements in the psychological realm from EMDR, brain spotting, deep brain reprocessing, DBR, are wonderful elements to explore to allow you to, to, um, to, to, to think about sort of bringing down the barriers that are in your heart that it will be preventing you from connecting to your inner child. And what I mean by that is that inner child that, perhaps was mistreated and didn't get her needs met is feeling very lost and alone. So if you feel at times abandoned, lost, alone, neglected, invisible, chances are these feelings have, uh, have originated from, from when you were young for whatever reason, and they, they've carried with you and stayed with you until, until you're an adult. And as a result, it's playing out in your body and, and probably reactivating trauma. So the very act of um, even just very simple things like, um, you know, uh, uh, being aware of having these more vulnerable parts can actually help you come back to your heart in a way, develop that compassion in a, in a new way and allow you to kind of acknowledge the hurts that you've had. Whatever has happened to you, you know, you have every right to, to acknowledge that hurt. We're not in a blame game. We don't go rushing off to anyone and say, you hurt me. What we do is we acknowledge, firstly, that there was, um, there was a mistreatment. We acknowledge that there was a hurt. And we acknowledge that we are responsible. Only us are responsible for, for, for moving through that hurt. And it can there, there will be parts of you, I'm sure, at times you just think it's not fair. It's, it wasn't my fault. How come they can get away with it and all that kind of stuff. But what we're really looking at is what, what do we have control over? And sometimes on this journey, we're not aware of the impact, the gigantic impact that we can have, not only on our on our brains, our psychological health, our mental health, but our, and our emotional health, which is, I believe, at the core of, of what's showing up in the body. But of course, then the rippling into our physical and our spiritual health as well. So um, as, as a practice that I would recommend is to, to put your hand on your heart, your right hand, left hand over right hand on your heart and let it place it on your heart just before you go to sleep. So you're lying in bed, and I just want you to, to literally feel the heat of your hand on your heart. And just if there is emotion there and you feel it's overwhelming, then you can sit up and journal about it. If you can sit with the emotion and know that it will pass, that's going to be the start of kind of like really allowing yourself to, to heal some of the hurts because it takes a lot of energy to keep that barrier and those guards up. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you... Uh, immediately drop everything and, and allow toxic people in your life. I highly recommend, you know, reading books about boundaries, how to put personal boundaries in place um, with certain toxic people. But what it does do is it, it allows for the release of tension 
that might be stored in your body, like tension myositis, which is actually restricts blood flow and oxygen around your body, which again can sometimes re relate to um, fibromyalgia, um, which is great sort of pain and tension and migraines and things. So even just a very simple, subtle, gentle act, and I'm sure there'll be parts of you going, but that's far too simple, Wendy. How's that going to help me? Just try it. It certainly isn't going to do any harm. What it is going to do is just maybe, just maybe, and I know it will, but give you some lovely warm feelings come into your body. Some nice warm sensations it might allow you to grieve. It might allow you to let go of any tension that's um, in your chest. Again, what's very common is for a lot of women with endometriosis is they really struggle to breathe. Like they really struggle to get oxygen, to fill the lungs with enough air and to come back. And again, that is very indicative if you've had a very troubled or uh, mistreated perhaps childhood where um, you know, animals in the wild, when they're under threat, they have very low, shallow breathing. Um, so again, there's some part of your body, some part of your past perhaps that is not allowing the, the full oxygenation of the lungs, which again, you know, again, it supports the, the whole sort of uh, oxygenation process of the cells, feeding all the different organs, and also, again, kickstarting the healing process. But more than that, it also helps to calm the mind. If you can breathe into your heart, if you can just put your hand on your heart or hands on your heart as you're going to sleep, and even just try and do some so deep breathing of 10 deep breaths, even just 10, if you can't manage 10, do five, you know, um, and just notice how that will calm the mind but most importantly, connect you to your heart in, in a new and wonderful way. So that is me for today. So keep um, looking after yourself. Make sure that you are doing all that it takes to, to keep you number one. And I will speak to you soon. Thanks for listening to Heal Endometriosis Naturally with Wendy K. Laidlaw. And I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and rate us. If you're interested in learning more, you can download your top five jumpstart tips at healendometriosisnaturally.com and jump on the VIP email list. Remember to keep you number one. The world needs a healthy you.